Part two will begin to look at the ways that Max and Xander noticed being treated as men and how it differed with the ways they'd grown accustomed to being treated as women. Men are good, as are you. Well, it's a particular kind of feminism, right? Like there's so many kinds of feminism, right? It's, it's this particular brand of feminism that um, gets a lot of airplay. That's the only brand I know. But, yeah. but anyway, um, let me show you um, this other slide, because this is a picture of Xander, I do believe, is it not? Yes. And that's from the Washington Post article that was, um, when was that, a year ago, Xander? Was it, a year? it was in June of 2018. Yeah, yeah. And uh, crossing the divide, do men really have it easier? These transgender guys found the truth was more complex. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a great yeah. quote from Xander in that article about the way you were treated and the surprise in your mind about the way you were treated. Can you tell us a bit about that, Xander? Well, there's there's a couple of different things. Um, I didn't realize before I transitioned that people had... I don't know, maybe lower expectations of me um, or that people saw me as more vulnerable or a victim. I mean, I was a dyke. I didn't see myself as vulnerable ever. <laughs> I think, right, but I think that just in generally speaking, right. I think people do categorize, right, the female as being more vulnerable. That's why we have things like women and children first, right? You, right. You're supposed to protect women. So, but I, I didn't have that framework from that perspective. My framework was, yeah, protect women because women are better. You know, like it's a different, <laughs> it's a different worldview, right? And so when, when I started to experience people seeing me and hearing me and then treating me like a man, there was this invisibility that came that at first was quite um, liberating, right? Because I went, for, I went from being like a poster child for diversity, right? It would, there was no escaping that I was a masculine woman, right? In my presentation, it was, it was uh, obvious. But as soon as my masculinity was then melded into a maleness, um, I didn't draw any attention anymore. And so the positive of, of that was that I was left alone. But the negative, so to speak, like the underside of it that I started to experience was people weren't taking the time to get to know me. Um, I wasn't being engaged in as um, deep of conversations anymore. The sense of going from a sisterhood to a brotherhood wasn't smooth. Um, the sisterhood was more like just, you know, a group of women in the same place at the same time. To me, it seemed as if the brotherhood required engagement, true bonding on a more on a deeper or more um, deliberate level, perhaps not deeper, de more deliberate. Um, and so it's you know it's been about maybe ten years since I started to notice that. So I'm as Max had mentioned earlier. I mean, I'm acclimated to it now, but. And I'm starting to reframe it to look at, you know, what really is the difference and how it's impacting me. And I, I can't articulate it very well yet, but I want to start looking at the differences as, you know, how do we treat men and women differently and different kinds of men and women? So, for instance, you know, my, I'm first generation um, Mexican-American, um, and this was something that somebody would know about me pretty quickly into our our interaction with each other, but now they don't know that about me. Huh. So now I'm viewed not only as a man, but I'm a white man now. And now, a whole different set of expectations and assumptions that come with it yes. that are so outside of my understanding yes. because it doesn't match my lived experience at yes. all. And let's so I don't really know how to, I'm not giving them what they're expecting, which I think then people go, oh, he must be gay because there's, there's something different, but they can't figure out what it is. Yeah. Um, but and then they hear that I'm married to a woman and they're like, wait a minute, I thought you were gay. So there's something about me that they notice, but they don't know why. They don't know what it is. Yeah. And I think it's this. It's just complicated. You know? It is complicated. Let's, let's look at a quote that yeah. you had in the Post article, if we can. 
And, and what continues to strike me is the significant reduction in friendliness and kindness now extended to me in public spaces. It now yeah. feels as though I'm on my own. No one outside of family and close friends is paying any attention to my well-being. Yeah. What do you think? Well, you know, part of that, uh, part of that understanding of, ex of that experience came through my working as a social worker with male veterans and male uh, military members, and um, especially the veterans dealing with homelessness. And what I came to realize is that you don't really see homeless women very often, and it's not because they don't exist. It's because they get brought into programs and provided services right. um, more mm -hmm. quickly. Right, so men are, men are, there are more men out on the streets, and I think it's because a lot of men are left out on the streets. Yes. Um, that's my interpretation of the years that I was working with the homeless male population. And so it, it carries over in some ways that are really detrimental to the psychological and the emotional and the physical well-being of men in our society. And then people are going to say, oh, men, they just have privilege. And I'm like, go talk to a homeless man. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just really interesting. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Everything is just, right. it's too, they're like little media sound bites. There's, there's no mm -hmm. real depth to what people are saying in this area. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, people who have asked me, uh, how does it feel to have all that male privilege? And I'm yeah. like, <laughs> you know, it's not what they're imagining. You know, it, no. it's, it's like they, they think I, they kind of think of my life now and probably Xander's life is like some kind of cartoon. It's like a cartoon cut out of something, you know. Yes. But uh, I've noticed that too, where, um, yeah, if you have an owie, <laughs> people aren't as sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, you know, right. you fall down and skin your knee, you're a guy, it's like, whatever. But it, it is true. Actually, the world is kind of a, a more, a little colder, a little more distant place. Um, you know, I, I'm more used to it now, but yeah, and you notice it in the beginning. People are, they're a little more distant. They're more wary of you. Huh. Yes. Uh, definitely more wary they're more suspicious of your intentions um particularly women but i think in general uh people are not as empathetic or sympathetic uh so it's different it's really different carrying yourself through the world as a man and, and it and it is not how they you know they the way it's dressed up to be some kind of amazing privilege it's not quite that simple yeah, really <laughs> well and it's mixed messages right it's you know be more in touch with your emotions and then, you know, you're crying man tears, <laughs> right? I mean, it, I think people, pe you know, younger guys, I don't know how they're navigating this. I really don't understand how they're navigating through this, um, through this world. You know, I feel like I'm a 52 year old. I have the ability to, to, you know, mediate and withstand and navigate through this. I don't know how I would be if I was 22 having to navigate through all this. I know. I agree. It's very tough because they're getting so many crazy messages, you know. It's interesting because I will say, and I do discuss this briefly in the book, that I did notice that I was listened to more. And it was kind of weird. Like when I would speak, it was, it was as though what I was saying was more important, right? Now, I'm not talking about necessarily talking about my feelings, but in general, even women who were lesbian feminists, right? who I didn't think were particularly sympathetic to men would kind of stop and listen to me more. So huh. there is that aspect of it where- What do you, you think that's about, of, Max? What's that about? Well, I, I was sort of mystified, but it was kind of like everybody thought what I was saying was more important, maybe because yeah. my voice was deeper, I don't know. Um, and I, you know, I was saying the same, I wasn't suddenly wiser or more important than I was before, but there was that aspect. So there is that aspect where you could say that's male privilege. The other side of that though, is that, you know, in a way, because you're listened to or what you say is somehow, I don't know if it's more important, but you are listened to more, <laughs> I noticed that. But on the other hand, um, maybe, maybe more is expected. So you don't shine as easily. But on the other hand, um, I mean, there is that wariness. It, you know, in, in some sense, you're given more power, but people with more power are also expected. People are more wary of them. Yeah. So that was a very mysterious thing. I know Lou Sullivan talked about that too. You know, and Lou Sullivan is a, a trans man. He, he passed away in, uh, he was a gay trans man. He, he passed away in, I believe, in 93. But he spoke about that a lot, how, you know, all of a sudden everybody listened to what he had to say more. 
<laughs> whether whether it was important, you know, it hadn't really changed. But I wonder so if it is to, that. I wonder if it has to do with the way it's projected. You know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't I'm know. I'm thinking testosterone probably gives you a certain forcefulness in your in your projecting out. I'm guessing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. I, yeah. I I have some different experience with that because one recent experience, I was at a meeting um, a conference planning meeting. There were five or six of us present. They were throwing out multiple ideas and I suggested merging some of the things together, like blending them and creating fewer options by blending, you know, topics together. Yeah. And it was sort of like, well, uh huh. And they went on. And then about 30 minutes later, um, one of the other people in the group, um, a, a young guy, he said the exact same thing and the person leading the, the whole meeting, a woman said, that's fantastic. That's a great idea. What do you, what does everybody think? And I thought, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Uh, yeah, right. I agree. Um, the other thing I would say is that. That was um, a TV I, commercial, by the way. As a social worker, <laughs> I find that I'm usually one of the only men in my entire department. Yep. Um, and so I have not had the experience of being in these meetings, staff meetings in particular, um, depending on the setting, either all female social workers or all female nurses, um, that they give me any extra space and time and attention. That is not happening at all. Right. You know, I'm not that, listening more to what I have to say at all. That could be because it's a female dominated profession. Yes. I, I you know, think that's probably yeah, part of it. Yeah. Sure. And, and what you have to say in work. So what you have to say in some way isn't as important. Like they're not necessarily thinking that, but they're responding no. that way, you right. know? Yeah. Right. And uh, I, I think I've had, I, I've had a touch of what you're saying, Xander. I've experienced, there are certain things that aren't taken as seriously, right? And I would, you know, I have to really think about this, but I do think that there's an aspect of being male where, um, again, some of it has to do with things, you know, like if you're talking about your feelings or about something upsetting you or bothering you, in some way, definitely that, that's not taken as seriously as before. So, um, but I- Or just you know, the I, clinical, the clinical, like as a man speaking clinically about male clients. That in particular, I've noticed there's, there's almost a sense of, People don't really understand that men experience depression differently, anxiety differently, right. you know, whatever situation they're in. So it, I think it just, it, um, if I interject from a perspective of, well, this is a man having an experience and it makes sense, it's almost seen as an illegitimate way to view the situation. Huh. You might, I'm sure, I don't know if you've come across that, Tom, in your work. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. I mean, it's, uh, in a female-dominated profession, the male voice is is less um, appreciated. I think, and well, also, that, I have I have a an, uh, I have an understanding that um, men with depression act aggressively. So when I'm around a man who's being aggressive, I'm not frightened by it. I don't want him to stop what he's doing. I don't pathologize it. I just say, oh yeah, that's that's how it comes out. <laughs> and wh what what do the females experience mm -hmm. during that? No, as no, that it's something that needs to stop. That it's a and barrier. Why does it need to stop? Treatment. I don't know. I, my assumption is maybe they're frightened by exactly. it. Exactly, they're afraid. They're petrified, and they can't they can't handle it. It doesn't frighten me. I, I say, right. let it out. Scream and yell if you have to. Yes. Reminds me of a guy in this workshop that my buddy did was an international workshop where they, they uh, one of the guy's uh, brothers died. A guy from South America. My friend had to tell him that his brother died. His friend told him his brother died. And the guy said, get seven men, meet me in the parking lot with some pieces of cloth. So my friend went, oh, okay. So he goes out in the parking lot with this guy, right? And the guy takes a cloth, clamps down on it with his wow. teeth, and he instructs the men as to how to hold him. And he's got seven guys holding him. And as they're holding him, he's struggling. Right, and right. My friend's thinking to himself, holy shit, what have I got myself into? But in about two minutes, the guy falls down in tears. Right, he right. falls down in a puddle of tears. And that's what he needed. He needed that movement. He needed that struggling in order to get to that point where he could express that stuff, you know? 
Remember in the, the part of the book, Tom, the part of the memoir where I'm talking about when I, I realize I don't, I feel really bad, but I'm not crying and I can't cry. Right. And I can't cry. So right. what I felt like doing instead was smashing things. I remember. And then I realized, wait a minute. I connected that to this is what I've seen guys do. Young. And it's like, that's what it is. It's that, and I didn't smash anything, but I had that impulse, that emotion right through me of like, I just want to smash things because I feel really horrible and, you know, down. But instead of being able to cry it all out, that's what I feel like doing. So there's definitely this real difference in how my emotions were being processed. Yes. And you know. that whole thing, Max, of wanting to strike something is exactly mm -hmm. what 13, 14 year old boys go through with this mm -hmm. testosterone flood. I would imagine, yeah. I, I would my, imagine. My yeah. own son put a hole in the door, you know, right. when he was 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like you're just learning yeah. how to handle that energy. Yep. This is yep. really powerful stuff. You know, it's yeah. really powerful. And yeah. it, it does push you to want to, uh, to learn to yeah. get something. Yeah. You know? Oh, and definitely. Okay. That feeling of I want to put my fist through that wall. <laughs> but you learned how to channel it. Right, and because I was actually at that time 32 years old, yes, yeah, I, I, I was like, oh, of course I'm not going to do that, but you know, there was this feeling anyway, and it was like, wow, that's really intense. That's so different, yes, you know. And so you can just sort of punch, you know, go out and punch a punching bag or punch yes. a pillow or just, you know, but exactly. you're, you, 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 it is really different. I mean, these are the things that trans guys need to learn. And this is what everybody, we're having to tell the whole world now because I think people used to know this and they still kind of do, but it's being forgotten and it's being pushed to the side because of feminism, yes. I think, primarily. Yes. Um, and wanting to think that everybody's the same, but with the reason they're all the same and they're all like women. <laughs> this, is, this is what we need to teach our young boys. Our boys you, need to learn that they have a different way, and it's okay. And it's okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, this is what they you hear, know. They hear a different message. The Division 51 I told you about before, you know, the, it was this one guy wrote this message. The message said something like, the world will be a better place once men can start acting more like women. Right. And that, well, good luck with that. Yeah, really. Right. That is the theme for right. this APA Division 51 right. study of men and masculinity is the theme oh, is no. men <laughs> are like women. And this is what they teach in elementary schools. Boys but are that makes no girls. sense. Well, it, it doesn't make no a sense list. Because which kind of women? Huh. Well, yeah, there's that. Right? The, there's that. The, ones who, the ones who beat their children? The ones or, who are like me. You know what I mean? The that's ones what they're thinking. Cut right. themselves or it, you will well, you know what's what's interesting is that um there's this there's I don't know how many of them are around the country, but I know for sure that I've I've learned about two or three around the country. There um one is called the Smash Shack, and it's mostly women who go there. It's where you go, you pay money and you throw dishes and you break things. Oh, huh, that's good. Right, so you pay money to go and break things, and it's marketed to women. You know, I think the one that I'm most, uh, the one I, I remember hearing about actually had a woman's name. It was like Betty's Smash Shack or something like. That. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, what's different? Oh, what's the difference good. between doing that and saying I need to go out and play a couple of good games of tennis to get to hey, get my frustration out? Like I don't I don't understand right. why why we differentiate. I remember working with a father whose child died, and he literally went out and bought a a set of cheap china and smashed the shit out of it. Yeah. You know, and that's what yeah. he did. And it's like this African ritual, you know, where the African ritual, when the, a child dies, the father will go out into the forest and shoot his arrows as fast as he can in all directions. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know? Wow. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, you see yeah. these rituals. If you study the cross cultural stuff, you'll see this masculine rituals all over the place and yeah. we're ignoring them, you know? Yeah. Just yeah. ignoring them. And we you know what it makes me think of, Tom? What's that? It makes me think of the restriction on grieving. Yeah. Right? Like there's, there are restrictions on how men can grieve. Right. They're supposed to be right? like women. And there's, there's, um, there's almost not even a recognition that men do grieve or that feel grief or like there's something about... There's something about that um, 
I've, I've, I've studied over the years something called moral injury that deals with grief and shame, um, in particular combat trauma or military sexual trauma, and the guilt and shame and how it, it, um, how it manifests in some of the symptoms that then we call PTSD. And so this, this inability to process the grief and the shame, it comes out as anger and rage and aggression and sadness and, and depression. And I mean, it, this is how it comes out because we're not really taught how to grieve. Yeah, and we're living in a very primitive culture too. I mean, we've, we're only a couple hundred years old and we don't have a lot of rituals that are there for people. You know, yeah. if you look at these these indigenous tribes, man, they've just got incredible rituals that, of course, they, but they've been around for thousands of years. So yeah. we, we need to give ourselves a break there a little bit because we're fairly new and we've got to learn how to do it. Man, I'm telling you, I could bend your ear a long time on what guys do that no one sees and, and they mm -hmm. do these rituals that are absolutely fantastic, uh, but no one sees it except them and, and they're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> but we better stop here in just a second. But I did want to ask one more question. What is the general uh, feeling in the trans community now about the, um, the origins of, of, of things for you for this? Do people talk about the testosterone <laughs> flood in utero? Oh, I, I think that's definitely one of the going theories as yeah. to why somebody would be uh, transsexual. Yeah, <clears throat> or feel such a close identity, uh, you know, is you know, it's beyond an identification. It's like yes. I am, you know, a man. I am male. Yes. In 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 my case, in Xander's case, <clears throat> I think that's true. But I think right now a lot of that is obscured. There is no real trans community, in my opinion. Huh. Um, you know, there's a lot of different groups and little, you know, and then there are people who are friends and, you know, but I don't really, you know, this community thing, I don't really believe in. Are they um, are there other but, theories other than the uh, testosterone flood about what's going on? Well, I, I think that's the main going one. Uh, yeah. But I believe that, you know, I believe that right now, unfortunately, the shift has, has happened towards, um, you know, people identifying this whole thing of, of identifying more with being non-binary or people who medically transition. We feel more and more marginalized. and you know, the people who are considered trans are often people who, you know, maybe they just identify in a certain way, uh, but they haven't necessarily done a lot of medical intervention. Um, and I think currently what's in vogue is the idea of social construction of gender. And oh. yeah, and, and of course, you know, <laughs> what, what I'm talking about here and what Xander is talking about, you know, when we talk about the testosterone at least is right. that there are, is a biological basis, huge, you know, and then huge. of course, and that what we do is we are actually changing ourselves biologically. Now, why we want to do that. You're talking about that. The ideology of that in some ways is a mystery. Yes. Um, I think it's still a mystery, but I, I do think the, the utero, you know, the possibly the testosterone at a certain time in utero is sounds pretty good. Yes. And something being different about our brains, yeah. but uh, but right now people don't really talk about that as much as they just talk about gender being socially constructed. Oh, oh, man, and, that's not good. Yeah, it's not good. Because it's fascinating. The the research on the testosterone in utero is fascinating stuff, and they they now have narrowed it down to four things they know are going on. One is that this flood impacts a sexual orientation, and it impacts gender identity. Mm -hmm. So those two things are critical. For, yeah. for what you're going through. I mean, that's just right. so, and this is in utero. Right. And the yeah. other two are aggressiveness and um, play behaviors. Uh, interesting. Well, yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. And they, yeah I wish sure that those are, are factors that are involved with this flood. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, uh, I wish that we would focus more on that and on the biology of this. Yeah. Just the amazing transition physically and and of course it goes over to socially instead of this whole thing of you know self-identification and social construction of gender oh, and, and just 80 million different program pronouns for all you know all the different pronouns and and you know and trying to get people to say these exotic pronouns which you know, some of them have never existed in the english language they've certainly <laughs> never been used yeah. uh you know and and 
I think for guys like me and Xander, it's pretty simple. We're, we're he and, you know, we're, we're men and, yes. uh, you yes. know, we're, you know, this is a pretty, it, it's not as exotic and maybe as exciting to some people, but it's, it's actually an amazing and radical and, uh, this, a uh, very magical thing. I think that guys, we've done. And you guys are pioneers. Oh, thank you're, you. You're pioneers. I mean, you're going where, as, as Captain Kirk would say, no man has gone before, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, literally. And yeah. Uh, I respect that. It's kind of like the MIGTO people. You know, they are signing off of women for a while or for good. And they well, are. Good luck with that. They're, right? they're pioneers. Right. They're pioneers. Yeah. They're going where other people will not tread. So I, I guess I have a soft spot in my heart for anybody who's a pioneer. So. Yeah. But I'm, yeah. Well, we, you know, we stand on, I mean, you know, I've been on hormone testosterone for 14 years. Max said 30, right? So it's, it's, it's the individuals from Max's generation, you know, that are the pioneers for my generation. And then there are people before Max, right? So, yes. you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of, of each generation that yes. came before us. Yeah. And that's yeah. a good But I, I don't know that there's such an attentiveness to pioneers, um, <laughs> right? The, the, the acknowledgement of the, the history of our, of the FTM, you know, the trans male community and what some of the people had to go through just to assert themselves and to get access to transition medical care versus how really simple and easy it is in most places in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, 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 I wish we had more acknowledgement of, of who's come before us and, and what they did. And we could bring some of that forward because I think it's getting lost in a lot yeah. of this more gender anarchy. You know, I am who I am because I say I am, and I'm a different me every day. And, <laughs> All right. and so it's like, but you know, it's like you go on. If, if, that's, if that's your life and that's how you want to live, you do it mm-hmm. in peace. I'm not yeah. going to stop you, really? but I don't like right. the reverse, which is then right. trying to say that people like Max and I are holding up a heteronormative, hegemonic, binary, gender norm, right, right. right? And so it's like, I don't even know. Like, you know, what does that even mean? You know, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like we, we're, we're different. Let's just acknowledge that we're different and move on. But we all want to have access to being treated um, fairly and with dignity and respect. And we want to yeah. have, you know, our lives be, you know, somewhat a semblance of maybe comfort and joy. Yes. And our yeah, I think, I, I a, think, <laughs> go ahead, yeah, man. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I think, unfortunately, the so called transgender movement has been captured or has, yeah, has been captured by a left wing ideological movement huh. that really has nothing or very little, it really has nothing to do with, you know, basic, basically changing your sex. Huh. And as I, I wrote about this in the book a long time ago, because the book was written in the mid nineties, but I could already see this on the horizon. And, yeah. and I, I made, you know, in the prologue, I say, this is not a movement. This is a sex change and anyone can do it. You can be a, uh, you know, an evangelical Christian. You can be a, a right winger. You can be a left winger. I mean, this has nothing to do with ideology, but now it's been captured by this extreme left wing ideology that is has to do with social construction of gender and breaking down the binary and you know i don't recognize it i really um huh. i think it's really unfortunate it's been a long time coming i knew that this was coming yeah, that's why i wrote that in, in the prologue back in 1995 yeah. but you know it's it's sort of taken over and saying anything outside yeah. that in our circles you know immediately gets us you know pilloried really? um you know, well, what happens I do, is we're we're not we're not good trannies, right? We're not the good we're not the good trans person if we yeah. aren't from that left wing ideological. If we don't come from that viewpoint, then yeah. we're not. It's amazing. We're, we're not seen as being um, positive members of our community. Right. right. It's yeah. amazing to yes. me that the the whole left wing thing is is about not really letting people be who they are. You know. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, who cares if you've got a, a, a wart on your ear? I mean, okay, you're a good guy. you got a wart on your ear. So be it. I mean, can we allow people to be who they are and love them for who they are? 
I don't think it's the left wing can do that. Well, yeah, yeah. And I not think this... it surprised people, right? Because, you know, um, I posted something on a YouTube video a couple of days ago, and somebody called me a MGTOW, and I said, I've been happily married for 17 years. <laughs> yeah, really? yeah, right. and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Or um, that Washington Post article got, so Stephen Crowder and um, um, I think the Blaze and a couple of other of the more conservative, you know, pundits, they took that article, my piece in particular, and ran with it. Sargon of Akkad did a whole YouTube video yeah. on my piece, almost mm -hmm. exclusively in a video. And the, mm -hmm. the comments were, you know, the, all of the assumptions were from the comments that I was, um, that sort of like, well, that's what you get, you left wing nut. And I'm like, I'm a moderate. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the yeah, assumption, though. The assumption is that we're all coming from that ideological right? point of yeah. view. And it's yeah. like, no, yeah. I'm not at all. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they've kind of ruined it. They've kind of ruined it for us. Yeah, they, I mean, people are confused anyway about this. Yes. I mean, yes. and they're it's still scary. confused. You know, they're, they're they frightened. Try, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, they're, and they're frightened. Yeah, they're, yes. they're, they were confused and frightened, and they're just yeah. as confused and frightened now. And now they want to put us all in this, you know, box with this transgender Absolutely ideology not. is what it's called, oh, transgender Lord. ideology. And it's not, that has nothing to do with it. Interesting. With what I did or what Xander did or what most of the, the trans people I know, yeah. um, you know, are, are, that is something that got pasted on. We're being appropriated and used by a political ideology to, yes. to, to uh, do, you know, accomplish certain ends, I believe. And it really, yeah. yeah, it really is not about us. Yeah, and it's, that's, that's critical for people to hear. You know, yes, that, absolutely. That, like, and we just been, need to focus on, we all want to, we, 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 we all deserve to have jobs, right? Yes. And we want, and some, we want our providers. Yeah. And yeah, and to be able to do the things that we need to do legally to be able to, to live and work in our country, right? We need identity right. that matches. So, so we have similar goals. We're just coming at them from different places. Yes. Right. I mean, yes. it, it's the difference between a civil rights movement, which I, would, which I support, of course, yeah. and a utopian social movement, which, want to, which wants to overturn all gender norms. Yeah. And, and the, unfortunately, the utopian movement has taken over the civil rights movement. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. I think you're so, right. Yeah. And that's a sad place to stop, but I think we better stop. It has been an enjoyable evening. I've really, really enjoyed everything you guys have had to say. And yeah. I think that some people can get something from what you're saying, you know, that you have some wisdom that, that is very, very helpful for us to hear. So thank you guys. Great. For Great. Spending the time. Thank you, Tom. And really thank you, Tom. Thank oh, you, you're Tom. very, very welcome. Absolutely. We'll see you then. Let me turn yes. this thing off. <laughs>